Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome everyone to this, uh, this evening's very special event, which we're very pleased to be hosting here at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. For, let me first of all introduce myself. I'm John Arbuthnot, the current uh, uh, President of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Not everybody here knows what the Royal Society of Edinburgh does. Sometimes I carry out a sort of question and answer just to see who in the audience does know that. Anyway, I'll spare you that by saying that uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh has been in existence for a very long time, since 1783, and we received our charter from George III, and we have been in existence ever since. And from the very beginning, uh, the charter stated that we would cover all branches of knowledge, and we are one of the few learned societies who have undertaken to do that. So to this very day, we cover all disciplines, um, the sciences, law, medicine, theology, um, public service, and the whole brand, whole range of subjects. So it's a very interesting body consisting of 1,600, nearly 1,600 fellows. That's what we do. Um, the, the lecture series in the Royal Society um, is recorded. Um, there is an account prepared which is then uh, posted on the Royal Society website. And this evening, we're really very, very pleased to welcome Lord Williams of Oystermouth to give him his full name, but better known to us as Rowan Williams, who's recently stood down as, um, as, as the Archbishop of Canterbury and um, is now presently in Edinburgh, uh, delivering the series known as the Gifford series of lectures, which are, has a long tradition, almost as long or as old as the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I think it was in 1885 that it was founded. Um, I'm told that earlier Gifford lectures were expected to give 24 lectures in the series. Did you know that, Roy? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we do 24 lectures now. Um, I don't think we really need to, to talk too much about Rowan Williams' background. He is an extraordinarily well-educated person. He is a scholar of the highest order, in addition to the work that he has done um, in his various roles in the ministry. Um, which have all been very distinguished. Um, he is, um, if you like, a philosopher and a theologian who has written innumerable books. And so he has given a great deal of thought to the topic that he's going to talk about this evening. In fact, he's not going to talk about a single topic, but he's going to give a, a flavor for the, the talks or the, the subjects which he has raised during his Gifford series. I think the Gifford series, if you paraphrase it, and I may get this wrong, but it, essentially it's to promote and diffuse the study of natural theology in the widest possible sense. In other words, what do, what do we understand by the knowledge of God? And that may seem a very short statement, but it has very many ramifications, theologically, psychologically, philosophically, and I'm going to hand over now to Rowan to take this thing forward, and then we'll have the discussion. Okay? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you for the opportunity of holding such a discussion here this evening. I look forward very much to questions and challenges after I've made a brief introduction to what I've been trying to talk about in the last couple of weeks. And the pattern of the evening is that I will speak for something around 15 minutes initially and then invite questions and comments. So as lectures go, this is quite light duty. <laughs> but if you consider that I'm trying to compress six that's, thank goodness it's not 24, six <laughs> lectures into a relatively short space. I have to crave your compassion and indulgence for this. 
As you've heard, the Gifford Foundation is to do with exploring what it is to know God. But more specifically, it was designed to encourage the study of natural theology, which, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries, was understood as the kind of talk about God that you did if you weren't taking for granted the doctrines of a church or a religious authority. It's very much part of the ideal world of the Enlightenment. Get away from arbitrary authority. Get away from the unaccountable and potentially superstitious control of the church. And you ought to be able to think more clearly about God. Now, many Gifford lecturers have expressed some unease about this, and I've been among them, because, of course, it's extremely difficult to talk about God as if nobody has talked about God before. And even if you have a fairly sceptical attitude to religious authority, the fact is that whether you recognize it or not, or like it or not, what you say about God is going to be interwoven with what communities of people actually do say and have said about God. So I've come to this enterprise a little bit cautious about the terms of Lord Gifford's bequest, but equally cautious about just turning my back on the idea that is encoded in it. And essentially, that idea is something to do with the question of, to paraphrase one 20th century writer, where exactly in ordinary language does talk about God come in? Because if we can't strip away the language of community and tradition about God and get down to some simple, rational, universal principles, and we can't, equally, we can't simply pretend that the language of any one tradition, any one mythology, any one system, will immediately communicate to human beings who don't share it. So the question is, how do we identify that complex, creative moment of intersection between how we talk in general and the rather strange, rather eccentric form of talking that we call theology, trying to talk about God? And that does seem to me still a worthwhile enterprise. Because it puts before us the question of how, as a matter of fact, people begin to talk about God. As a matter of fact, very few people begin talking about God because they've read a book of natural theology or religious philosophy, closing the book and saying with an air of discovery, I never thought of that, perhaps I'd better go to church. <laughs> Any more than the other way round, very many, many people lose their faith by closing a volume of, let's say, Professor Dawkins and saying, I never thought of that, I'd better stop going to church. <laughs> the motivations, the circumstances that lead people into new kinds of language, into or out of faith, are a great deal subtler than that. And what I've been suggesting in the Gifford Lectures this year has been that we need actually to look at our language itself features of how we talk as human beings and ask whether there are not some features of talking about anything that seem to open doors onto talking about or maybe listening for the transcendent. A story which I haven't uh, mentioned in the Gifford Lectures but which I did discuss a bit in a lecture a few years ago is the story of that remarkable Dutch Jewish writer, Etty Hillesum, whose journals were published some 10 years ago. A young, very, very secular Jewish intellectual in Amsterdam at the time of the German occupation. She ended her life in Auschwitz, a victim of the Third Reich. But during the years of the German occupation, she wrote a very substantial journal, and a number of her letters have also survived. And that journal describes how one secular, educated person began to think of what she had never yet really come to terms with, and to cast around not so much for a system to believe in, but for a way of speaking and acting 
which carried her forward into another way of being in the world. She summed it up by saying, I always said I would never kneel. I thought kneeling was a debasing posture. And here I am finding myself kneeling in the privacy of my room. Why? Who am I kneeling to? What am I kneeling for? And she left the answer to that very vague. She was never an orthodox believer. But her experience, partly her own intellectual and philosophical exploration, partly the pressure of unspeakable circumstances in Amsterdam, the experience of her own suffering and the suffering of those around her, brought her to a point of saying, the way I've been talking about the world and relating to the world is inadequate. I can give you a description of what's going on around me, but there is something else for which I need a gesture, a symbol, a word. So she would kneel down in silence in her room. And the last words we have from her are a postcard which she sent from Auschwitz, describing how she and others were deported from Westerbork transit camp in Holland. We left the camp singing, she says. It's the last we hear of, hear of her. It might be of interest to note that in the same transport was a middle-aged, originally German, nun of Jewish origin called Edith Stein, Sister Teresa Benedicta, now Saint Teresa Benedicta, a pupil of one of the greatest German philosophers of the day, a formidable philosophical writer in her own right, who had become a Carmelite nun, fled to Holland to escape from the persecution of the Jews and had been rounded up in Holland. I wonder if they ever met and what they had to say to each other. But the point is, here is Etty Hillison asking, not how do I describe the world, but how do I respond adequately to the world? And in the lectures I've been giving, I've suggested a distinction between two kinds of talking, describing and representing. We think we're describing the world when we produce a reasonable catalogue of the sort of things we see around us in the world. And that gets us so far. And on the whole, we have good and reliable criteria for knowing what is a good description and what is a bad description. But we also represent. That's to say, we respond to the world around us with words, images, and gestures, which we believe hold or carry some dimension of the world we're in, but don't fit into the neat categories of describing. So we may say that a certain kind of reaction to circumstances represents the full seriousness, the full range of a situation, even if it doesn't try to describe exactly what's going on. And in the lectures, I've been looking at some of the ways in which language itself, not just religious language, but language in general, pushes towards that frontier and beyond it, manages the business of representing rather than just describing or just analyzing. So I've looked at the ways in which our language is not easily analyzed as just a system of stimulus and response. We don't actually know in advance what any of us is going to say. And it's an enormous fallacy to suppose that we do. As I said in one of the early lectures, if I say to you, your next statement will be, determinism is true, now I see it, you will think, why should I say that? And if you're very bloody-minded, you might even respond, you only say that because you have to. <laughs> so whatever we say about our language, it's not like that. There's an area of underdetermined activity. We can't say this is exactly how the process of speech is going to turn out. Similarly, there are no last words. We all have the experience in ordinary conversation, I think, not least with our children sometimes, of saying that's my last word on the subject <laughs> and discovering rather to our surprise that it isn't because the person we're talking to will have something to say and we can't foreclose that. Also, we have to come to terms with the rather curious fact which we 
often forget that our speaking is a physical activity. Sometimes we talk as if talking went on literally in our heads, not with our vocal cords, our lungs, our heartbeat, our hands. We communicate, we express in all sorts of ways as bodies. And to understand that fully, we may need a picture of the world which allows us to say our speaking is part of a whole set of strategies of relating with a world which gives us intelligible messages. The whole of our response to the world is intelligent. The very nature of our material existence is shot through with intelligence. There isn't a standoff between mindless matter and this mysterious gaseous stuff that lives inside our heads. We are always engaged with a material world which proposes itself to us as making sense and of which we then try to make sense. And then, of course, one of the things we do with our language is to put it under pressure. We do strange things to it. We make it, so to speak, stand on its hind legs and dance. We put it through the complicated processes of rhythm and rhyme in poetry. We develop it with metaphor and symbol. We drive it to the point where we say paradoxical things because they're the only way in which we can hang on to the full dimensions of what comes to us. And when we think about paradoxes and metaphors, we do realize that at any given moment, what we think of as simple and straightforward descriptions are always breaking down and we are always being pushed, both in the sciences and the arts, to move outside that and find new ways of speaking, which initially, at least, look very, very untidy indeed, and sometimes almost contradictory. And we work at that, and we find new settlements, and then we unsettle those again. And so our language moves on. And of course, in the middle of all this, we use silence. We find there are moments where what we want to say can only be expressed by saying nothing. Those of us who have experience in the pastoral world will know a bit of what that means. There are moments of acute stress and suffering in the presence of which any pastor is a fool if he or she tries to come in with lots of words and explanations. But I think also of an experience that I often notice and am always rather moved by and that is at the end of a really overwhelming play or concert, the pause before anybody starts applauding. The longer that pause, the better the performance. And what are we saying, saying, in inverted commas, in that interval? Something very significant that that play has made possible. But there are many other ways in which we use silence, once again, in ordinary contexts, as if we were declaring or showing that there is something in our environment of such significance that we cannot hastily run to name it or tie it down in any way. And so in all these ways, I've been suggesting with a certain amount of example and argument that the very way we talk as human beings is far less prosaic, descriptive, determined than we might at first think. There's something about the very nature of ourselves as language-using beings that seems to project us over a frontier of comfort, outside a comfort zone, into what is often very untidy, very inarticulate language but language which we go on seeking to refine and develop because of a remarkable act of conviction and trust that we are in an environment where somehow sense or meaning, intelligence and intelligibility are around us and we are seeking somehow to align ourselves with that. And perhaps, and I wouldn't go a great deal further than this, but perhaps 
that is one of the significant frontiers on which we begin to see why and how people start talking about God. And there are features about classical talk of God in the Christian and other traditions which suggest precisely that the impact upon us of what we believe to be the reality of God is invariably to do strange things to how we talk, to drive us to metaphors and symbols and to drive us into silence. In all this, we're not ever saying we can't tell the truth about God any more than we can't tell the truth about the world. But I'm suggesting that we ought to recognize that telling the truth is a good deal richer and untidier than we might suppose if all we think of in relation to telling the truth is getting a nice exact reproduction of what's out there. When there is a pause at the end of the play or the concert, a truth is being told about what has happened. We are truthfully representing something which we have not yet and perhaps will never find words or gestures for. And to bring that dimension into focus, which is not easy, is part of the job, I think, of a philosophical approach to religion. And I believe very strongly we can talk in those terms without simply buying into Lord Gifford's view that somewhere there ought to be a rational, universal way of talking about God that's not messed up by religious professionals, archbishops and people like that. And equally, without supposing that the only way of talking about God is simply reproducing the orthodoxy of a religious community. There is a frontier of interest, creativity, suggestive and provoking in all sorts of ways. And it's that frontier I've been seeking to explore and reflect on in the six lectures which I've had the privilege of delivering last week and this week, and which I've attempted with uh, somewhat qualified success to jam into 15 minutes or so of the summary this evening. Thank you very much. Imagine that the obvious question many people who've been at the lectures will ask is if you can say it that briefly, why have you taken six lectures over it? <laughs> we've, just been, we've just been given a clock. So it tells us we've got to finish it sometime. Um, well, this is now a time to have a discussion, and I would like to um, just give the ground rules, which are simply that you hold up your hand. We have microphones on both sides of the room. Uh, we would like the questions to be as, now we're trying to use the right kind of language here. Sensible. Um, <laughs> concise. Um, I'll, I'm not saying anything about being sensible at the moment, but concise to begin with. And then we will, we will um, exchange views on this really quite, I mean, extremely thoughtful subject of how we speak about God and uh, how that is reflected in the language of theology, which is a very challenging thing. But I think, Rowan, to begin with, you were not simply talking in the context of that kind of lang language and discourse, mm. but the examples you gave were of people who had spoken or written at, under conditions of considerable stress. And where they had to seek from within themselves some kind of explanation of a situation which seemed to be inex inexplicable to them. Is that a reasonable starting point? Yes, and uh, my only qualification is about the word explanation. Yeah. Because I think if you look at the life of somebody like Etty Hillison, or indeed Edith Stein, it's not explanations they're after. It's, it's a, way of, a way of carrying on, a way of making sense, and a way of... A, a way of acknowledging, I think, perhaps that's the word, acknowledging something about the world which explanation won't quite get to the bottom of. So it's, right. it's quite a, a large thing there. Who would like to ask the first question? Um, and please introduce yourself, although I know you very well. Hmm. Um, Jens Horrans. 
Um, Ron, thank you, and thank you especially for this extremely lucid summary of what you've been saying in the first five lectures. Um, my question is, do you, are you trying to say to us that theology is of a fundamentally different kind of discourse from the discourse, perhaps, which a person might have with a person whom they love dearly, whom they do not always understand, whom they find fragile, creative, unpredictable, full of life, um, never able to be entirely comprehended, and for whom one is trying to allow space so that you are not imposing your forms of discourse upon them. Now, is theology fundamentally different from this? I don't think it is, and that very um, profound and, if I may say so, moving characterization of how we do talk to people who matter to us, I think does show us how little is catered for in thinking about language by a narrowly descriptive model. And as I've said once or twice in the lectures and in other contexts in the last um, week or so, there is something in our culture at the moment which assumes there is one and only one adequate model of knowing. And actually, when we break it down, look at how we use the word knowledge and how we think about knowledge, as in the context you've outlined, we realize that to claim to know is, a mu again, a much richer and a much more diverse thing. Certainly, um, what you characterize and what I've been trying to explore is a form of talking, form of discourse which unavoidably takes time. And we're, again, a very impatient culture as well as one that's narrow in our understanding of knowledge. All the things you mention are about time-taking. I once, years ago, came across a remark by some celebrated agnostic who said that uh, at school he'd been made to sing a hymn containing the lines, only believe and thou shalt see that Christ is all in all to thee. Well, he says, I tried it for a day and he wasn't all in all to me, so I stopped. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's the problem. In the center, mm. yes. Yeah, I'd just like to, to pick up almost your last theme there of one voice as it were, and the philosophical approach, it seems to me that you're outlining, and regrettably, in practical sense, crystallizes into a number of different specific expressions of what God means to one faith or another. And so I'd like your comment on that, but on a specific question in relating to the one voice versus the many voices, in your role as Archbishop of Canterbury aches, what would be your opinion on disenfranchising the Church of England and replacing it with a government forum where all faiths, all interpretations of God were given equal voice, but no one faith had a specific place in the legal parliamentary system? Thank you. Uh, two very interesting questions, I think, and I'll try to tackle both of them. Um, the first, I think the, the problem with, perhaps with that way of putting it, is it suggests that you know, we, we, or all of us, or human beings, start with a general view, and then it's sort of channeled, decanted into lots of little containers of different faiths. Whereas, in fact, historically, faiths grow up within cultural environments, and it's perhaps only rather later that, in the context of interreligious dialogue, you begin to see, well, we have, we have things we can talk about. We have, we have a grammar we can share in some ways. And that's one of the excitements of interfaith dialogue. Not that we're looking for you know, a single universal religion with everybody agreeing. I'm glad to say God forbid about that, because that, as soon as you try to crystallize that, it becomes deeply boring, actually, and rootless. Um, and I'm a Christian because I believe the revelation in Jesus Christ is, is true. It doesn't mean I, I can't talk with the Muslim, the Buddhist, and learn from that enormously and come back enriched and hope they are too. So um, I just want to question, I think, the idea that somehow it all began rationally and then became a bit sort of 
diverse. It, it, it's always diverse. But now to your second, um, I think, very uh, mischievous question about the Church of England and its disenfranchisement. When I'm asked to talk about the establishment of the Church of England, I've almost always been tempted to say, in the immortal words of the Irishman asked for directions, I wouldn't start from here. You know, I, it's a bizarre political settlement in all sorts of ways. My problem is that most of those people who want to see the Church of England disestablished actually want to see religion pushed further out of public debate and discussion. And that's when I tend to get a bit counter-suggestible and dig my heels in. And I say that partly because of what nearly all of my non-Christian religious friends and colleagues used to say, we need the Church of England established so that there is a channel for all the other religious bodies to negotiate with the public square, with the state. Now, that's an odd and a not very rational picture, but it does seem to be one that bears some relation to reality. When various um, crises came up over my ten years as Archbishop, and there were one or two, um, there were occasions where um, I and my staff would say, OK, I think it's time we got a dozen or so religious leaders here at Lambeth and got a statement together. And everybody took it for granted that that was something that the Archbishop of Canterbury ought to do. And sometimes I would have letters from the chief rabbi or one of the Muslim leaders saying, you know, time you got us together again. We need to talk about this. Um, likewise, we increasingly in the last few years were able at Lambeth to convene uh, faith-based development agencies, Islamic aid, um, various Jewish relief organizations, some Hindu groups, together and talk about common policies in international development and relief. Now, the point I'm making rather um, lengthily <clears throat> is that there's a bit of a working protocol which the establishment of the Church of England helps to happen. My unease about government convening a representative council of faiths is, and I'll be very blunt, the massive illiteracy of government about faith. One of the difficulties that we were often up against was the assumption made by some people in government that all other faiths were a bit like the Church of England, only in fancy dress. <laughs> Therefore, you had to find the Muslim equivalent of the Archbishop of Canterbury, or you had to find the local equivalent in the community of the vicar. And I remember a long, long discussion with one senior politician who shall be nameless, where I, I and my staff were trying to explain step by step, that actually faiths worked very differently. The nature of authority was radically different in the Muslim and Christian environment. And that's why it was quite difficult just to round up the usual suspects. And given all that, um, the establishment of the Church of England, which doesn't in fact give us any um, financial advantage or any um, any guaranteed voice beyond the bishops in the House of Lords has generally worked for the advantage of other communities better than most other arrangements I can think of. So it's a highly imperfect system, but I'm waiting for a better one to come along. Sorry to waffle on. Can I just ask um, a follow-up question to that, which is um, in your conversations, which must have been really quite important conversations with representatives of other religions, mm. We've been talking about the language. What were the most distinctive features that came out to you mm. of the language that these people were using? That's a very large question, actually, um, and I'm not sure I can... <laughs> you're, you're entitled. Um, a lot depended on who you were talking to. Um, and sometimes we'd have a very diverse group of people from several different faiths. <clears throat> More regularly, um, I suppose because of political considerations over the last decade, there was a rather intensive and focused build-up of conversation with Muslim groups. And we put a lot of energy into developing that. But let me see. A couple of examples, perhaps, might be best. 
Every year I chaired an international group of scholars and religious leaders, Christian and Muslim, in different parts of the world. Um, it's called the Building Bridges Seminar. And what we would do in those contexts would be to take a common theme, let's say um, justice or poverty or the role of women or tradition and modernity, pick out about half a dozen important texts from the Christian and the Muslim tradition and read those texts intensively together, Christians and Muslims reading the texts together, and reflect and go, from there. and go from there. And what that did was it brought the actual texts we used in worship and reflection into discussion. We didn't try to talk in the abstract. We tried to say, now, if that's you know, a, a major text in our tradition, where is that taking us now in relation to this problem? And how do we link it on to the trajectory that comes out of another tradition? So that, that was very very fruitful. Occasionally, we ran into real brick walls um, and expected to. Um, I can remember the moments where we sort of looked at each other across the table, blanking comprehension, and said, well, I really don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So you're not talking the same language. We're not talking the same language. But the thing is, you only find out you're not talking the same language by starting to talk. Right. And obviously, with the um, Jewish colleagues, it was in some ways easier, and then in some ways, again, you would hit brick walls. With um, Hindu and Buddhist interlocutors, different problems would arise. With Buddhists, of course, you have to remember you are not dealing with a community who believe in a personal God in the way that Christians, Jews, and Muslims do, and you have to allow for that. With Hindus, you have to recognize a profound interweaving of religious ideas and social forms, mm -hmm. which we can barely get our minds around. They're so inseparable. And that could sometimes, again, be one of the brick walls. But as I say, you only meet the brick walls, you only find you're not talking the same language by meeting. Okay, next question. <coughs> yes, at the back, the very back. <coughs> I think we should actually say who we are. Thank you. My name is Stephen Wood. Um, I was thinking about silence and time. And I was wondering if you would mind speaking as a poet about the importance of waiting and inspiration and spontaneity in the making of art. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Um, let me start by saying that my experience as a poet, such as it is, has a lot to do with, with a sort of internal listening. It's impossible to write poetry, I find, just by sitting down and saying, I'm going to write a poem. It's more that perhaps you've got a bit of space, a bit of time, and you say, all right, I'm, I'm going to invite. I'm going to listen and see if there's an image that suggests. And then just listen for what's bubbling under the surface of it and see if I can give it time to come to the surface. Now, sometimes that's entirely frustrated. You listen and nothing comes. W. H. Auden said that the two things that poets were familiar with were the idea that comes too soon and the idea that comes too late um, in writing poems. <clears throat> An idea comes too soon and you don't know what to do with it. You haven't got the equipment to deal with it. It comes too late, the moment's passed, the, the fire has gone out. So listening for the moment when you actually try to draw something out, very, very delicate sort of ah, calibration of, of listening and time-taking. And another experience which I think a lot of poets have is that some poems walk in ready-made almost, and some take forever. So there are two or three poems I've published about which I could say they wrote themselves. I, I suddenly thought, oh, yes, <laughs> scribbled it down. 
and I could see the or hear the the images following the logic, the direction, and very often the shape of it. Yes, this is going to be this is going to be three line stanzas, um, probably about ten of them. Yeah, see that, and then I start marking in the margin. One, two, three, pause. One, two, three, and. Yes, not like doing a brass rubbing, you know, the image comes up. And then you have two or three lines that come or an image that comes and you sit and you sit and you sit and nothing happens. One sonnet sequence I wrote years ago, seven sonnets, I wrote six of them in a great rush. And it was then several years before I wrote the seventh. I knew it wasn't finished. I knew it wasn't finished. It could, have, it could have been published, but it wasn't finished. And at odd moments I kept, as it were, calling in and saying, are you there yet? <laughs> and eventually it said yes. So that, that's part of it. I would also add that I, I'm one of those people who believe very strongly that poetry is for the ear, not just the eye, and that what compels on the page in poetry is what has some kind of music, some kind of, again, material sort of echo and resonance within it. Not just the ideas, not just the shape, but, but the sound. We um, are celebrating this year, of course, the centenary of R.S. Thomas's birth. And there's a poet who writes about waiting quite a lot, but that would take us off in another direction. <laughs> Question from Angus. Could you? Thank you, Angus. I'm interested in the poetic stream that you're following, and uh, there's a wonderful comment by Wordsworth who said, "The poet speaks not to be heard, but to be overheard." Um, how do you reconcile? the obliqueness of that train of thinking mm -hmm. with the fact that in your role as Archbishop, you had the imperatives of having to take decisions. I mean, <clears throat> all conversations we would like to <clears throat> be an engagement which was enlightening and was not pushed by having to reach <clears throat> a final answer. Unfortunately, you know, where you are a leader, you don't have that luxury. I mean, as a theologian, uh, how does that bur burden <coughs> bear on you? Oh, well, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> there are three things, at least, um, going on in a question like that, I think. Um, one is to do with poetry and other kinds of speech. One's to do with theology, one's to do with decision-making and the shaping of an institution. Sometimes they overlap, often they spin apart. So to start with what's both the simplest and the hardest, yes, of course, there are decisions you have to take. Um, who am I going to invite to the Lambeth Conference and who am I not? Um, is this a case where we have to um, take a problem to an ecclesiastical court? Is this the person we want to appoint to this position? And so on. And that is indeed what you're there for. And the process is one in which you try very hard to take as many views as possible, balance out what you think is for the overall good of the widest definition of the community you serve, take a deep breath, say a lot of prayers, and decide, and live with the consequences. There's no, because I, I wasn't the Pope, there was no infallible guarantee of getting any of that process right, but you live with it. <coughs> now, let's put that in the context of theology. I have a very deep theological conviction, which I think is, is rooted in the New Testament, that, to put it in shorthand, only the whole church knows the whole truth. 
In other words, the more voices you're listening to in that process, not just the better pragmatically, but the more theological. You're trying to get every voice heard. And even if you make a decision, I think the day after you have to turn back to the people who may be disappointed or frustrated or disillusioned with that decision and say, that doesn't mean I've stopped listening to you or that we've stopped listening to you. We need to carry on a conversation even though a decision has been made. Let's take it on to the next level. And I, I say that theologically, as I say, not just pragmatically, and not just because I'm a, a cuddly bully liberal. You know, I do believe very strongly this is the process of moving towards a fuller discernment of the truth. And it's very hard work because it's a lot easier to cut off the discussion when, you know, when the decision's made and just say tough. And that, that's where we move on to the, you know, the third bit of the jigsaw, which is the poetic. Um, theology does repeatedly itself come to points of decision a few centuries in the early church, and you have creeds emerging, crystallizing what people want to say together as Christians. And I don't believe myself you can just unroll those or go back behind them. That's part of what makes us who we are. But those creeds are themselves not, if you like, a tombstone on discussion. And poetry is one of those things that keeps alive those dimensions of humanity and belief, which not even the finest and most orthodox creedal definition can, um, can capture. Look at the poetry of somebody like George Herbert or Gerard Manley Hopkins, mm. deeply conventional orthodox Christians, mm. but they knew they had to let their emotions and their perceptions and their doubts find a way out as well. Mm. So in those three ways, I, I found I was very often being stretched and, yes, burdened, I can't deny it, by the decision-making bit, because um, that doesn't come very naturally to me. I'm naturally an indecisive person, and I naturally like to be liked. Um, neither of those particularly good recommendations for being Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> but it mattered, it mattered a lot to me as Archbishop to keep thinking theologically and to keep writing poetry, precisely because I wanted to m put the decision-making in the context of a theology, and the theology in the context of a continuing attempt to be an honest poet. To there are two questions waiting, one here and one there. <coughs> I'll take this one first and then over to you, okay? Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you, Lord Williams. The evening has been very interesting. Now, some months ago, I emailed my two friends here asking if they'd like to come to this evening. And I said, being email, I wrote it in cyberspeak, I talked about Rowan Williams, the former A-B of C. Now, only this kind of language could have brought out that there is an implicit order to your title. And you've talked about different kinds of language, you know, describing, representing, and you've talked about poetry, which is metrical, measured, and ordered. Are you able to give examples of your own discovery of implicit orders in faith or society because of different kinds of languages that you've talked about? Hmm. That's very searching. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this is quite what you have in mind, but let's try it and see. Um, I grew up in the 60s with all sorts of talk around about civil rights and the discourse of human rights was built into my own sort of political and social vision for a long time. Increasingly, I came to think of the language of human rights as a very thin and rather problematic kind of thing unless it had a clearer sense of what's human built into it. If it's just about rights and claims, then you know it's, it's, it's thin. If you fill it out with understanding what the human is, I think it gets better. And I suppose part of my theological 
journey in the last 10, 12, 15 years has been again and again to find myself exploring what I think you're calling the, the order implicit in human rights by thinking through what do I mean as a Christian by thinking of a, a human being before God, a human being made in the image of God. And again, rubbing at the surface of that to see if something like a defensible, a coherent picture of human rights comes through. I, f I find it does, and I find there's a lot of you know, energy that comes in that engagement. And I'm, I've not got much patience with those religious people who write off the discourse of human rights. But if we're looking for order in human affairs, we need, I think, a robust three-dimensional picture of what the human is. That's part of what my own explorations in religious language are about for me. I don't know if that's quite what you had in mind, but that's just a thought in response. Thank you. Yes, over to you. <clears throat> uh, I'm Sandra, and I want to ask a quite simple question about, you know that God is, uh, Jesus is actually a real person in history. And um, in the first century, and but uh, he wasn't. He wasn't actually. But a lot of people at that time believe that he's the son of the God. But he wasn't in the real history. He wasn't actually like um, very um, mystery like this. So I want to ask: at that time, people believe Jesus because they need a help from a spirit. Uh, like they need their spirit, they need to believe something, give them a hope. Mm -hmm. But now the modern, so, the, the modern society is quite good, and uh, mm, the, we live, uh, the, which the 21st century we live, is quite a good time. So why do we still believe God? We don't need a lot of help with the... Thank you. That's another big question, isn't it? Um, my first reaction is to say the 21st century is, is not bad if you live in certain bits of Edinburgh. It's not brilliant if you happen to be in Congo, Syria, Iraq, or so on. You know, suffering remains absolutely fundamental, and even in comfortable places, suffering, need, and bafflement about the human condition are absolutely real. But even granted that, I don't think, you see, that God comes in just to make us feel better. God comes in to enhance and enrich and fill out our humanity to its fullest capacity. God is interested in our joy, not in solving our problems, interested in expanding our hearts and our minds, or so I believe. And that means that when Jesus is reported in the New Testament as saying, I have come to bring life and give it in abundance. I think that is as absolutely true in the 21st century as it is in the 1st century. There is a gift of life, a gift of enhanced, enriched existence and deepened, consolidated relationship both with God and with one another, which is what is offered and is needed as much now as ever and arguably more. I, I'd love to talk more about the Jesus of history and what I believe he was about, but. Let's leave it there for the moment. Yes. Robin Hein. I uh, heard in uh, your first lecture you drawing on one aspect of psychology about the development of the brain in terms of metaphor and language and the different balancing <coughs> aspects of language. I, I just wondered whether you had attempted to explore uh, another aspect of psychology and language, which is just about the development within the child's speech as to whether there is a particular point at which uh, some of those uh, facets which you're sort of saying, you know, open up language to thoughts we've not had yet, uh, where, where it comes, whether, whether you've had yep. any time to think about that. Thank you. Um, the answer is that, <clears throat> yes, I've, I've looked rather superficially in that direction, but haven't dug around too extensively. Um, there is some very interesting work done on not only on the, the origins of language, but the origins of religious language in small children, which is fascinating in itself. 
um, and in some ways theologically very reassuring. <laughs> um, <clears throat> small children often have a far better grasp of theology than their elders. Um, I've been looking a bit also at um, at the question which uh, you could sum up rather briefly by saying there's a, you know, there's a sort of debate between people who think, first of all, we sort of know ourselves and then we relate to others. And those child psychologists and others who say, well, no, actually, the child's experience is relational from the start. There is never a moment when there isn't an other. Mm -hmm. There is never a moment when the child doesn't exist in an ecology, in a, you know, a system of interaction. And that's as true of language as of anything else. Read some textbooks, and you imagine that you know, the small child is a hermit in a tower, working out a map of the world and things to say about it, and then launches out, you know, goes public, so to speak. And that really bears very little relation to how people actually learn language or anything else and how they grow. Yes. <coughs> So I find your <coughs> scholarship mind-blowing and your intellect um, so powerful that it, it's frightening. I have read quite a bit of your poetry. I enjoy reading it, but a, a lot of it I'm lost in. And I'd like to share a problem with you. Um, I'm a retired headmaster named Bill Donaldson. When I was a boy, I wasn't particularly bright, but I think I was very sensitive. And I wrote an essay uh, on suffering where I looked at... Uh, suicide, I looked at the Holocaust, I looked at various aspects of that time, and I was so disturbed about it that I went to Henry Donald, who was a head of English, and asked him to comment on this and, and tell me where I should be going. And he simply wrote across in large letters, acceptance. And when you were talking tonight, you said, I believe that um, Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection are true. And this is obviously the foundation of all you've done. But I'm very frightened of the philosophical side of your, your thinking that sometimes it obscures what is so critical, the certain, certain certainties that must be the basis of our life and our preaching. And I'd like you to comment on what I was trying to do in my essay and what you would have said. Mm. Yes, I, I feel I should apologize really for um, obscurity of expression which I always have a lot of difficulty with um, as you may have noticed <laughs> but um, it seems to me speaking I suppose as um, a more or less unrepentant intellectual that somebody within the church is, has to go and do some of the complicated work and just uh, try to imagine in advance how difficult it can get and see if they can lay, lay a few foundations for that. Um, there are people in the front row who, who've done this with greater distinction than I, and you know, I think that that's just one of the things you have to do. Um, because there are a lot of people around who say, <laughs> essentially, that religion makes you stupid. And I, I don't believe that. And I think it matters that the church gives a little bit of space to people to explore um, in the imagination and in intellectual ideas as well. But there is absolutely no way round the imperative when, you know, when I'm in a church on Sunday morning, finding the language that is most effective, most vivid, most, I wouldn't say simple, but at least straightforward. Um, horses for courses. There are things I can say in a seminar that I wouldn't necessarily say in the pulpit, by which I don't mean I'm concealing anything, but there are ways and ways of talking about this. I don't, preaching to um, a congregation in rural Cambridgeshire, or indeed even to my own students in Magdalen, um, I don't tend to talk very much about phenomenology or um, patripassianism, you know. My task is to try and kindle their imaginations and their faith. And, and there are always overwhelmingly simple things to come back to. And in a sense, all I've been saying tonight and in the Giffords is 
a very roundabout way of saying, well, however complicated or sophisticated the systems, the pause at the end of the concert is in a sense what really matters, where faith is concerned. And I think your, um, your essay and its response says a lot there. Well, unbelievably, we have used our time. It's seven o'clock, and um, I think the last question and the last answer actually is, is a good way to end this. Um, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask for a, a, a vote of thanks in a moment. But I think Rowan, you're really pretty happy, chipping away at the co face of uncertainty. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
Now this is a very simplistic account of the rich tapestry we have had so far in the lectures, but, and people have commented to me again and again on the poetry of Lord William's language, and he has held his audiences spellbound. The lectures have certainly admirably fulfilled the terms of the Gifford bequest, which call for an exploration of natural theology in its broadest intellectual context. His insistence that language is an embodied phenomenon and his insistence that it must be approached through the methods of the natural and the physical sciences as well as the humanities and the social sciences reflects, I think, too, the ethos of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. We have been honored to have him with us this evening. I think one of the most attractive aspects of Lord William's Gifford lectures has been his generous responses to the questions after each lecture. There have been a large number of questions after each Gifford lecture, partly because he is so gracious and so encouraging, so welcoming to his questioners. And I think our, our conversation with Lord Williams this evening has reflected this warm intellectual engagement, this sense, too, that the audience is part of a, of a shared project of great importance. One final point, uh, the final lecture, the final Gifford lecture will be held on Thursday, tomorrow, at 5.30 in the assembly hall on the mound. And the title, the title is, Can Truth Be Spoken? Everyone is warmly welcome to this lecture. Whether you have booked in advance or not, please feel free to come along and, and, and welcome friends too. So could you join me once again then in expressing our appreciation to Lord Williams for his talk and uh, the conversation of this evening. Uh, could I thank uh, Professor Brown and thank the Gifford um, Trust for supporting this discussion. And um, Lord Williams, this is the last word. Um, you have given us an, a very pleasurable evening. As has been said, you have been totally open with us and revealed lots of your inner thoughts. And for that, we are most grateful and thank you. Thank you.